Hello and welcome to the first session of our three-part webinar series, Rethinking Manufacturing, brought to you by BDO Australia and the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre, or AMGC. My name is Ryan Pollitt and I'm BDO's National Manufacturing and Wholesale Leader and I'm very proud to be hosting this series. Uh, before we kick things off, I just wanted to draw your attention to some housekeeping matters. Um, then we're going to put a slide up on the screen that shows some of these points so you can read them there. Um, we will be accepting questions throughout the session and you can submit these using the question tab um, on your screen. Uh, we will try to get to as many of these questions as possible, however if we cannot respond to your question we will be sure to follow up with you after the webinar concludes, so please don't feel that uh, your question has not been noted and um, we will definitely follow up and respond to all questions. Uh, we won't be using slides for the content of our presentation. It's going to be more of a Q&A type discussion between each of us. However, we've included a couple of slides that we've put together in the handouts tab for you to access if needed. If you do experience any technical difficulties, please click the support button, which is one of the bottom tabs on your screen. And finally, all registrants for this webinar will receive a follow-up email containing the slides, a link to the recorded session, access to register for future sessions and the speaker contact details for all of us and we certainly hope that, that you enjoy this session and that you'll uh, register for the other two sessions in this series. Okay so I just want to kick things off now so I'll just give a little introduction and then we'll we'll go through the uh, the panelists before we get into the discussion. So over the last three months the manufacturing sector has had to respond rapidly to the changing market conditions from COVID-19. While it's highlighted sovereign capability gaps in our supply chain, it's also highlighted the ingenuity of Australian manufacturers. We've seen the ramping up of production in regional areas. We've also seen manufacturers pivot to meet the demands of the pandemic and collaboration on a scale not previously seen. More recently, we have seen companies like Woolworths beginning to reshore nappies, which has been quite a turn up for the books. It's also enabled conversations about our manufacturing supply chains and the future of Australian manufacturing to be featured more prominently in both the national and local media. Overall, the Australian experience for manufacturers has been remarkable in identifying a clearer roadmap for the future. Today, we're going to discuss the Australian experience uh, of manufacturing during COVID further, with a particular focus on supply chains, collaboration and the resilience of the sector. So with me for our discussion today, um, I've got three great panellists. Michael Sharp, uh, who's the AMGC National Director of Industry. So Michael joined AMGC in 2017 and has a key role engaging with industry across Australia. This includes linking partnerships among the country's manufacturers and research facilities, which is vital for creating high value jobs and products through collaborative projects. Also joining me today is Kieran Hines. Uh, Kieran uh, works for Infosys Portland Supply Chain and he's the risk practice lead. Welcome, Kieran. Kieran leads um, Infosys Portland Supply Chain Risk Practice with nearly 20 years of supply chain experience in industry and consulting. Kieran has spent over a decade developing industry tailored approaches to the supply chain domain to accelerate the development of genuinely resilient, cost efficient, and dynamically stable supply chains with a transparent and defensible design. And finally, um, my last panelist today is Kamal Prasad, who's a BDO technology advisory partner. Welcome, Kamal. So Kamal is a partner at BDO and the technology and advisory team with over 20 years uh, global cross-sector experience. Kamal's expertise lies in four areas, including performance improvement, tech-led business transformations, advanced analytics, and emerging technology. So welcome to all the panelists. Okay, so without further ado, I think we'll, we'll get into the discussion. And um, the first question, if I can kick things off with you, Michael, if that's okay. Um, so as someone at the front line, hi, Michael. <laughs> as someone at the front line with a link to government, industry and other institutions, can you describe the Australian experience for manufacturers at the peak of COVID-19? Oh, absolutely. It's um, been one hell of a time, hasn't it? But we've very quickly seen the manufacturing sector, or as we like to call it, it's a, a capability. Uh, Australia's capability for manufacturing has adopted uh, some great uh, initiatives and been able to pivot very quickly. So we have 47,000 manufacturing companies right across the nation. Um, when 
you know, we first started getting the news of COVID, we had manufacturers reaching out to us to say, how can we help? And so to me, you know, that's, I'm pretty proud of the response that uh, we had great manufacturing companies willing to stand up and serve in the time of need. Uh, a couple of examples there straight away was that uh, we had Striker Medical, which is a global uh, medical company, reached out and said, we've got this great design for a, an emergency hospital bed. Uh, now, this is a US firm, a global firm headquartered out of the United States, uh, but they needed to build a local supply chain to build that design. Uh, so we, just a few short hours, uh, we reached out to our members and quickly built that local supply chain. And within two weeks, they had the prototypes up and running. And so now 500 of those beds have already been sent over to Western Australia, uh, to the Department of Health uh, in Perth. And now they're looking at uh, export opportunities uh, to export these beds that are manufactured right here in Australia. Uh, so that's some good news and certainly shows the power of collaboration. Uh, we knew long before uh, this current crisis that we needed to break down more barriers between our great researchers and industry. And we've seen some great uh, projects that we've been able to uh, co-fund and demonstrate that research, put it into action, and uh, see that the universities and local industry collaborating uh, to take new products to the world. Um, so we've seen that uh, happening right now. Um, we saw companies pivoting to hand sanitizer, of course, but very quickly we knew that there was um, some hurdles around that sort of thing too. So we were able to work with the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and very quickly TGA put out um, um, advice around hand sanitizer production. And so we were able to put that out through our channels and work with um, manufacturers big and small. I'm sure we all saw the local breweries that uh, shifted quickly and instead of producing uh, the beer and uh, gin and all the rest, they were able to make hand sanitizer, which was gratefully uh, accepted and, and needed. So yeah, it's been an exciting time in, in that way, uh, but manufacturing is certainly proving to be resilient. And uh, as I started with saying, it's certainly a capability that we need as a nation. Mm, th thank you, Michael, that's great. And I suppose just building on um, a couple of uh, the points you, you made there, um, in terms of some of the, the manufacturers that you've been working with, when, when COVID hit, um, what was the immediate impact that you saw on, on those manufacturers in terms of uh, impacting their supply chains and, and the way that they were planning for the future? Do, do you have any sort of examples of things that you've seen in, in that nature that, you know, when COVID hit, how do they deal with that? Yeah, again, it comes back to this key word of collaboration, you know, working together and mm. supporting each other in your local community, but also between states and, you know, as a nation. Um, so I guess the very first calls we were getting was around how do we make our workplace safer um, with the COVID and setting up hand wash stations and the like. Um, so if in the first few weeks, I'm sure we'll all recall that uh, getting hand sanitizer was hard to get a hold of. Um, so we were able to advise, you know, let's go back to what we used to do was using buckets of soapy water. Um, so setting up um, hand wash stations was important in the first few weeks until that hand sanitizer became more and more available. Um, so safety was paramount, uh, which was good to see. Um, but also the companies that were pivoting then needed that advice of how to go to market. So very quickly as an organisation at AMGC, we built the manufacturer's response portal. And we had about 2,500 companies uh, within a matter of weeks register their capabilities on that website, which is still available now for anyone to use. It's transitioned now, uh, it's fully open to the public. It's a free resource at amgc.org.au. And that's where any company can register their um, suppliers of uh, medical PPE, whether it's gowns or hand sanitizer or a whole range of um, needs. Uh, can automatically be connected with uh, customers. So hospitals or GP clinics, mining companies, uh, anyone that's needing uh, medical PPE can link onto that website and be connected with a manufacturer somewhere in Australia to provide that. So that was a great service that we were able to provide very quickly and it grew astonishingly fast, um, but it's been able to uh, expand to be this great service right now. Thank you, Michael. And um, picking up on that, one another step further as well. I think the response register was um, an excellent thing that AMGC introduced to to you know help facilitate um, collaboration during that difficult period. The other thing that I know that AMGC have had in the background um, throughout this and prior to COVID even was the uh, the learning academy. Is that something that you could talk a little bit about in terms of how that might help foster collaboration in the industry going forward as well? 
Oh, absolutely. It's It's been my great privilege to travel all around the country and meet with companies big and small, and I guess particularly in the regions uh, today through you know this technology I'm, I'm, I'm calling in from uh, Moree in the northwest of New South Wales. So uh, talking with some manufacturers out here around hydrogen production, and so getting that into the agricultural sector. Um, but to visit the regions uh, and meet with companies has been terrific. Uh, we set up the Manufacturing Academy uh, just late last year. So that's at manufacturingacademy.org.au. And that's where we've been able to interview our members and let them share their stories about how they're transforming their business to become advanced manufacturers. And that's all the things around export opportunities, uh, how to um, look at the transformation of digital technologies, uh, how to connect with uh, our great university researchers and other organisations too, like the Smart Sensing Network uh, in New South Wales or the Arm Hub around robotics up in Queensland. We've got the Innovative Manufacturing CRC uh, headquartered in Melbourne, uh, but operating nationally with uh, the Future Map uh, Digital Tech. So th through our AMGC website, we can connect you to all these great organisations, um, connect you with industry, and look at the collaborative effort uh, that can help your business to grow. Thank you, Michael. That yeah, that's excellent. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely share those links as well after the session, so everyone that's uh, listening in now is aware. Uh, Kira, maybe I could just move the discussion over to you now, if that's okay. Um, just wanted to talk a bit about the supply chain side in a bit more detail. So as an expert in supply chain risk and resiliency, how have you seen COVID-19 disrupting supply chains um, during this time? Yeah, thanks very much, Ryan, and, and thanks for having me here. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't want to be the I don't want to be the ying to Michael's yen there and and kind of bring all the doom and gloom from the from the supply chain risk perspective. But you know, I guess my focus throughout this has been more over on what's kind of what what hasn't gone to plan um, than than what has. And you know, I think I think um, to, to echo Michael's comments around the the Australian you know the the good old Aussie ingenuity our ability to pivot and adapt rapidly to to that changing environment is um was a really strong feature of that and and um and the australian community um the australian manufacturing community and industry more broadly really did band together um to kind of overcome some of those short-term challenges um but the the reality still remains that we're we're part of a global community right and we can we can talk about um, onshoring different manufacturing activities, but in a in a globalized world, the reality is that we're always going to have some level of exposure um, to to offshore influences, whether that's um, you know the the production of raw materials or unfinished goods that are um, then you know developed into finished goods um, manufactured or assembled in Australia. There is going to be that exposure, and it's very difficult to. Um, to, to get rid of that completely in a, in a globalised world. So, um, you know, the, the the biggest impacts we've seen in the industry have been all over the news and, and they've been well worn around, um, you know, PPE responses and, and stuff like that. Um, the 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 heavy reliance on China from from PPE, um, you know, it, from a supply chain perspective, when we had a, a supply shortage that was overlaid with a demand event, it was the perfect storm, right? And so the impact that that had from a freight perspective uh, is businesses were paying um, four to five hundred percent um, per TUE for um, for freight shipping rates and. Um, even you know seven to eight times that for air, air freight rates um, per kilo. Um, the the shipping lead times went out from you know basically you could get available space immediately to having to wait six to eight weeks, and that had that um, concertina effect through the supply chain where you know delays were in, um, were were experienced. Um, you know the the great toilet paper shortage that we all talk about. That that's a that's a um, Australian supply chain um, almost, you know, in, a, in its little ecosystem, but just from those different um, demand signals, you know, they had to ramp up production. Um, and then we knew that product, that that demand was artificial and that it was going to drop off at some stage, but we didn't know exactly when. Um, and those toilet paper and napkin manufacturers realised that they were going to be left holding the can with a massive um, 
you know, inventory that would be on, stuck on hand at the end of that. And they just kind of had to suck that up at the end and, and accept that. So, you know, these were all the things, I guess, that I was seeing out of the, um, as, as the kind of flow on impacts from a, from a manufacturing perspective, from, a, from an inbound supply chain perspective in Australia. Okay. Thanks, Kieran. And I mean, was there a, a, a common risk or issue that you saw as a recurring theme um, in those supply chains that was causing those issues? Perhaps something that, you know, as, as a nation, we should be focused on trying to fix going forward? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the, the, the flip side of the coin of Australia being able to pivot and adapt really really quickly is is i think a general and this isn't universal of course but a general lack of preparedness within the industry about what what was happen about what would happen um followed by you know a, a lot of people getting taken by surprise and then a flurry of activity um, to come up with plans and then implement those plans um, as we were doing it so from a national perspective i think the takeaway is um, we we need to be more prepared at, at every level of business and industry right up to government level so that we're not coming up with the plans and then having to execute them at the same time. We've got those plans in place. You know, everybody's busily working now to protect themselves from supply shortages from the next global pandemic. But, but but I don't think that's going to be the source of risk, right? Like this could well be the catalyzing event for any number of possible futures around that. You know, we've got trade tensions um, cropping up. We've got um, uh, Brexit continuing to unfold. We've got um, increasing geopolitical tensions and we need to be cognizant of all of those um, and, and understand the impact that that's going to have on the supply chain bef well before it happens and have a plan in place to, to execute when it is time to do that. And, you know, being able to see all the leading indicators and the, the markers and the flags and stuff. Um, again, we can, we can look to onshore the most critical parts of our supply chain and, and make sure that the manufacturing is, is um, done within Australia. But unless you're going all the way back to raw products, the, the best that you can do is build yourself a bigger buffer if you're still relying on inbound you know, raw materials or unfinished goods coming into Australia. So if you do have that reliance on overseas, um, then you really need to understand exactly where you're carrying that risk. Um, conversely, we're seeing just in the last couple of days that that risk doesn't have to come from international sources. It can come from domestic sources as well. You know, um, Victoria is in the process of being locked down at the moment. What exposure do other um, manufacturers in other states have to Victorian supply chains? And is that going to cause them a disruption? Is that something that they've already planned about? So these are the type of questions I think we really need to be asking ourselves. Thank you. And I suppose just just picking up on that is, you know, in your experience, you know, with some of the clients that you you've been working with, are there any sort of practical tips that you can you can give around how they might look to overcome some of these issues going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you know, <laughs> unsurprisingly, as the supply chain risk advocate, you know, I take a risk first approach to everything. And that doesn't mean a risk averse approach. It's just understanding what your risk is and, and making decisions that are aligned with your risk threshold. So um, the first thing, and this is particularly important from a manufacturing perspective, is to really understand exactly where your supply chain is coming from. Um, so many organisations know their primary suppliers, and then that's where their visibility stops. A lot of manufacturers do have visibility of their secondary suppliers as well, but not necessarily all the way back to you know uh, um, raw materials. The, the classic example is the um, in the automotive sector is the um, uh, the the company in in India. There was one factory that produced all of the um, radiator caps for pretty much every production car in the world. And of course, you can get everything done, but you can't roll a production car out out the door until you've got a until it's got a radiator cap. So um, businesses quite often get drawn into looking at their the, the areas of greatest spend or their biggest suppliers and use that as an analogy for um, that being the biggest source 
source of risk. But you know, history has shown us over and over again um, that that the the, nat the very nature of risk is that it can the biggest risks can come from potentially the smallest sources. So um, mapping the supply chain, really understanding what your supply chain looks like in the first instance, um, and then a really really um, powerful but drastically underutilized tool um, in in supply chain risk assessment that that would otherwise be really well utilized in the manufacturing setting is failure modes and effects analysis you know we look at our production plant and we do failure modes and effects analysis on every part of it because we want to keep that machine running the supply chain is just a machine it's 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 slightly bigger context it's got different influences and different moving parts but you can run a um, failure modes and effects analysis on your supply an entire supply chain um, in the exact same way you know severity occurrence detectability detectability in supply chain is is a really overlooked risk mitigation um, technique as well so just running putting putting that overlay onto your supply chain can really identify and pinpoint where those areas of greatest risk are and then that, that allows you to focus your risk mitigation resources on them excellent thank you very much Kieran that's that's fantastic uh, Kamal perhaps I'll, I'll just open it up to you now as well I mean um I mean, Kieran made some great points there in terms of, um, you know, some practical advice around supply chain risk and resilience and some steps that companies can take. Is there anything that you can add to that from, from your side, you know, perhaps with more of a technology um, bent as well? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ryan, and uh, uh, great uh, to be a part of this discussion. Uh, going, going to your question that you're highlighting in terms of uh, how technology could play a role in mitigating some of those risks. I think one of the examples that uh, uh, I've seen recently is a lot of a lot of the inventory issues are now getting tackled through digital because uh, inventory was always supposed to be a buffer for not having that information or what are the, the unknowns in the supply chain. But looking at getting better availability on data, running better analysis on that data, and creating that predictive analysis on that is actually helping clients and organizations to replace uh, information uh, with inventory. Now that, that has become a lot more uh, pertinent in the situation that we are in. Um, Kieran mentioned that there are changes that are happening both on the demand as well as on the supply side. Now, if you look at on the demand side, uh, the biggest change that has happened is we don't know how people are going to buy. Uh, so a lot of those uh, uh, in-store sales have got replaced with online sales. A lot of the online sales have actually got shifted to combined with something else. So the buying channels are changing. Then you have the demand side challenge of buying behaviors are changing where uh, you know uh, toilet paper is a classic example where if somebody is, as a family is buying uh, 24 rolls in a, in a fortnight. Now they've, they've been holding uh, 10 rolls or 24. Now that's where the buying patterns are changing. So that is, there is a lot of shifts and, and changes that are happening on the, on the demand side. Now, if you go on to the supply side, uh, some of the risks that Kieran highlighted in terms of where that product is coming from. And given the global nature of a lot of our supply chains, we are getting more and more connected into what's happening in in Asia, what's happening in, in Europe, and any disruption in that supply chain has got a massive flow-on effect for us. So that 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 all got, got impacted because of COVID. And then the second part was that the because of the, the lead times uh, that were people were planning around three weeks, four weeks from China and probably three or four weeks from, from Europe, but because of the disruptions, all of those lead times all very easily got doubled in, in a lot of instances. So with that combined change on the demand as well as risk on the supply side, it became more and more interesting how information sharing and that collaboration became the key thing to actually respond to some of those changes. So I think that's where learning from those experiences and le leveraging technology more to manage those changes both on the de demand and supply side, I think that's where I'm seeing a lot of the analytics and data playing a big role. Thank you, Kamal. And um, so, is is analytics, you know, one of the main areas that you think 
companies could look to introduce to, to help with that issue? Or is there also some other areas of technology that you'd recommend people start to focus on? It, it, it was interesting uh, when Michael, you were talking about uh, some of the some of the themes that you've been in, uh, investing in: uh, smart sensors, um, future technology, digital. I think those are all the concepts that, when they come together, that's where the magic will happen. Now, I think uh, what, what, one of the things that we need to learn as, as a nation and consider is, if we go back. 10, 15 years uh, where manufacturing was strong in Australia. One of the reasons that we, we started going backwards in, the, in our manufacturing capabilities, uh, maybe two reasons. The first one was a lot of our innovations plateaued out. So we got to an innovation curve and then we became more and more commoditized in what we were doing. And then the second part was that our manufacturing technology became quite stagnant. So uh, the, we were not able to compete with the global on on the cost parameters, on quality issues, and all of those things. Now, to, to look into what is going to be where the future is going to be, I think that's where things like uh, digital or industry 4.0 is going to play a big role, uh, where we can actually bring all these concepts of sensors, uh, robotics, and look at innovation and bringing, in, bringing that innovation to life more quickly. I think that's where technology and, 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 and industry 4.0 will play a big role. So that's one part where I can see uh, a, a bigger role for, for, uh, for technology. The second one we touched upon, which was around collaborating uh, across the supply chain. So it's replacing it data with, with inventory. So that's going to be the second part that's going to come into play. And then the third part is going to be around uh, how do we actually link that data in, uh, to decision making? Because that's where there is a big gap in the industry where the data is available, but the decisions are still made on or based on gut feel. So it's going to be how do we actually get the mind shift change where all of that information is going to be available, but how do we click that into the DNA of organizational decision making so that people can take the decision with their gut as well as all the insights that's coming from based on the data. So it's going to be industry 4.0, collaboration, and then better use of data to, to make decisions. I think when all of these three things, and when they come together, that's where I feel the future of manufacturing is going to be. Thank, thank you, Kamal. That's great. And just wanted just quickly follow on from that. Um, Michael, just to throw over to you for a second. Um, in terms of some of the, the companies that you're dealing with, have you seen advanced manufacturing techniques and you know things like 3D printing or or even some of the things that Kamal was talking about as well? Have you seen those increase you know, during this environment? Or if not, do you think there's opportunities for that to continue to be a focus going forward? Yeah, and a lot of this was happening before COVID. You know, the, the smart companies were looking at all the new technologies that they could implement in their company. But also supply chains. Mm. You now we're talking about the circular economy and using waste as a resource. But just to touch on Industry 4.0, I always like to let mm. people know that in reality that's the fourth industrial revolution. So it's this digital transformation of manufacturing. But if I take you back to Industry 1 or the first industrial revolution, steam power, and that was a step change like the world had never seen. And so we have a, a member company in Newcastle, the Varley Group. Um, 132 years ago, George Varley started that company by transforming sailing ships into steam powered vessels. Uh, it's still owned by the Varley family today, um, and now they employ around a thousand people or more uh, and exporting globally. Um, the second industrial revolution or industry 2.0, I uh, think Henry Ford and mass production. And at the time, I'm sure people were saying, well, what's going to happen to all the jobs? You know, with this mass production, it's going to take all the jobs. What will we ever do? And so I think things have a way of repeating themselves, but the smart companies do adopt and they look for new technologies. They look at new designs. They look at strengthening their supply chains and using new materials. And we're seeing that yet again. Industry three or the third industrial revolution is pretty much when I was at school and um, the internet was coming on, you know, this new world wide web. And I remember at the time that Bill Gates put out a book called Business at the Speed of Thought. And we were looking at the Y2K bug and uh, all the things that were going to go wrong around that. Um, but quickly we adopted the technologies 
again, the smart companies look for the opportunities and getting the right skill sets on board uh, to grow their companies. Uh, so think about Varley Group over 132 years, how that company's had to adapt and evolve through world wars and, and now COVID, um, and yet that company has continued to grow. And that's just one example of many. Um, so industry four, where we find ourselves today, this digital transformation, certainly it's a change, but I can tell you that the companies that are in, putting in robotic cells into their business, just as one example, those companies are growing. They're putting staff on um, because now a, a manual handler can be skilled up as a robotics technician. Um, they can lift more in a more safe way. Uh, it improves the quality of the products. And so because you've got a, a higher quality product to export to the world, you get more customers. Um, so again, on the AMGC Manufacturing Academy, you can hear from business owners all across Australia sharing their examples of how they're transforming their business even today. Yeah. Absolutely, Thanks, Michael. Brian. And just Ryan, Ryan, if I can add, add to that. Uh, I think uh, when, when you were talking about the, the industry for or the fourth revolution and how, how companies have, are adopting it, I, I'm optimistic that COVID is actually a catalyst to enhancing the adoption of 4.0. So going back to sort of one of the reasons why our manufacturing became globally uncompetitive was because of the labor cost that was involved in there. Now, the, the industry, industry 4.0 robotics and the sensor technology that is coming in, that has got so much power to actually create the, the manufacturing lines of the future where you can change the line, you can actually build new products and get the products to the market in a much faster pace. So with, with the technology and with that innovation that's coming together, I think uh, digital and industry 4.0 has got the, the potential to actually transform manufacturing for Australia. Thank, thanks, Kamal. Yeah, I, I think that's a great comment. Um, thank you. And, I think what, what I'll do is I'm keen to get into some of the uh, the audience questions that are coming through, and a, a few of them are actually picking up on um, you know some of the themes that we've just been talking about there. So um, perhaps uh, this one, maybe Kieran, I'll I'll throw to you this one first, and then um, obviously Michael and Kamal can add to that if um, if needed. Uh, what what can be done to help companies make the current shift to Australian-made versus import stick? i.e. not revert back to, you know, post-COVID, revert back to, you know, the, the norm being non-Australian made. Do you have any thoughts on that one, Kieran? Yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got plenty of thoughts. It's a $64,000 question, right? And I think if we could solve that, I'd be sitting on a, on a yacht somewhere instead of having to work for a living. But, um, you know, there's a number of things. That, that my, my, the other side of my career is in procurement, you know, and we've been the, the procurement industry in Australia has collectively been responsible for driving, offshoring, low-cost country sourcing, um, you know, um, production consolidation in China because cost is a focus of so many companies um, driven by, you know, ultimately by shareholder expectations, right? Um, so it's an insidious one to overcome. I think um, what COVID has introduced into the argument is not just what's the cost of the product but what's the cost of the failure as well um, and that's a question that CEOs and boards need to be asking themselves whether they're getting the best value for their shareholders um, by uh, getting getting their cost base as low as possible or whether they would get more um, value out of reducing their likelihood of failure. You know, we've seen from a supply chain failure perspective that um, it's it's not just, you know, operational overheads and some lost sales and stuff like that. It's lost customers, it's reduced customer retention, um, it's reduced market capitalization and reduced shareholder value, right? So in, in four steps there, we've gone from what's been seen historically as, a, as an operational issue to an issue that needs to be addressed at a strategic level by the business. So um, in an indirect way of answering that question, we need to kind of change the culture of businesses in Australia to think of um, the, the total cost of ownership of running the business 
um, not just what the bottom line on the balance sheet says, but actually, um, you know, how do we how do we main, maintain customer sales? How do we maintain our customer retention rates and deliver better longer term value to the to the shareholders? Thank you. Does um, Michael or Kamal, did you want to add anything to to Kieran's comments there? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, I just think there's a few examples I can share and some great stories. On the Manufacturing Academy, you'll see many of our members talking about it's not what you make, but how you make it. And we say that is advanced manufacturing to look at what we call the smiley curve. Everything from design and research right over to sales and marketing. So much more than just production, more than just making things. Um, so we have um, companies through this crisis have looked at new ways of advertising and looking at their sales and marketing. Um, a great company up in North Queensland called Norwell. Uh, have a look at their Instagram page. Uh, they developed an Instagram page um, some time back and just from an Instagram photo with the right hashtag keywords, uh, they developed an export market to Saudi Arabia. Uh, since then, they're and still only through their Instagram feed, they're now exporting to the United States. So this is a company that employs around 15 people and they make the ute trays for the back of Toyota Land Cruisers. So high quality uh, manufactured goods in North Queensland. I uh, think the pop-up campers or um, all, ma all manner of tools and equipment for the mining sector on the back of your Land Cruiser, this company makes those and they export globally. So the quality is outstanding. Um, another small um, company in rural Victoria uh, called Davos Fence Clip. Their only source to market is through Facebook. They don't even have a website, they just sell through Facebook. They go to um, uh, trade shows and farming markets all over the regions but during the crisis they were able to reach out to their customers and say how can we help what 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 do you need what assistance and all of that through Facebook so we were having workshops with AMGC where I was saying to our members a great opportunity is to look at new ways of sales and marketing more than just making things how can you get it out to the right customers how can you create value and build a bigger customer base and so the last example I'll share with you is one of our members in uh, the central west of New South Wales called Midland Trailers. Now they make very big earth moving equipment, uh, the low loaders or the trailers uh, to, to move equipment around. Uh, so you're talking, you know, uh, big dollars for these units. Uh, and yet because of Facebook ads, uh, they hadn't tried it before, but because of the crisis, uh, they were looking at new ways. They got onto Facebook, they paid money to use the Facebook ads, but just in the last 12 weeks, They've secured new customers and they're building more trailers than they normally would each month. Um, so I encourage people to look at new ways of doing business and we'll get this Australian made thing happening even more strengths to our arm. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I, ho I hope so. And um, there's some great examples there that show sometimes a small change is all that's needed to make a big difference. Um, and I think it, you know, it comes back to the points that you were you were making, Michael and, and you, Kamal, as well, around Industry 4.0, you know, potentially being accelerated during this this time, because, you know, it's not as scary as people might think. And you know, as you said, Michael, you know, you go back to the first um, industrial revolution and the second and the third, and you know, that was scary at the time. But actually, small changes and incremental change or increvation, as as we've coined that phrase at BDO before, um, can make you know a big difference in the long run. And um, yeah, another another sort of connected question that we had from the audience, and maybe Kamal, I'll throw this one to you first, and then um, the others can join as well. Um, do you think that um, with post-COVID, uh, we'll tend to have an increase or a decrease in vert vertical integration in manufacturing? Um, so you know, Industry 4.0, as we said, is already there, layered across um, everything that's happening in the background. Now we've we've got COVID that's come in. We've already said that might result in an increase in adoption of Industry 4.0, but do you think that will lead to an increase in vertical integration or, or decrease? So I think I think it's 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 a very it's it's a great question, and and the answer is very much sector dependent. Uh, I think if we unpack as to what underpins uh, Industry 4.0 or what can make manufacturers more successful, I think that will help us uh, address this question. So I think. If I look at uh, the different layers that will make this come together, it's going to be around the innovation piece that you were talking about. Now, innovation is happening everywhere. 
it's going to be as to how do we actually tap into that innovation and make it commercially viable as quickly as possible. That will be a big part of it. So a lot of the companies are actually going and doing crowdsourcing for innovation. Now, in, in, in that sense, they are actually going back into the vertical integration part of it. But the way that they're doing it is they're doing it differently. So rather than having an in-house team that does the ideation and then brings that idea to life and then commercializes it, they're taking, taking control of the value chain, but they're actually using a broader base to get the ideas. So that's, that's a big change that that's gonna happen. The second part is I think there is always gonna be a role for a specialization. And, and that specialization gives you volume, it gives you uh, efficiencies, and it gives you a, a cost base that will make you competitive. And if you go with that specialization concept, manufacturing is gonna be a network of manufacturers bringing things together to give you the final product. Now in that network of manufacturers or net network of supply chain, I think it's not going to be around who owns that part of the value chain, but it's going to be who coordinates or who orchestrates that value chain that's going to be critical. So I think this whole concept of vertical integration or specialization, we we'll have to look at it in, in different terms now, where it's not about doing it yourself, but it's around bringing it together, being that integrator of ideas, integrator of products, and that's going to give you the specialization and that's going to give you the edge which will drive market share thank you no great response and um kieran michael do you either of you had anything you wanted to add to that kieran? i think there's some real practical simple ways oh, that michael. companies can look to grow as well is just through again collaboration some of our workshops have been terrific where we've got members together and membership of amgc is completely free we're just building this ecosystem across australia to uh, support and grow the capabilities, uh, big or small. Um, but one of the workshops I had up in uh, Armidale, one of the members got up and said, I've got issues with transport. That's a, sometimes a hassle to get the transport on time that I need to get my goods up to uh, Brisbane um, and I'm having no end of hassle. What, what could I do? And in the same meeting was another company uh, just south at Armidale and he said, I've got my own trucks and I come past your place every day. So we can pick up your goods and we can work together. Um, so that's in a practical, simple way of how manufacturers, if we can get people working together and supporting each other, there's some great benefits out there and it doesn't have to be too technical. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah Thank I, you. I'd, I'd, Go on, I'd certainly um, uh, e echo those two comments and p perhaps rather controversially, I might go as far as to say the, 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 the concept of vertical integration in the traditional sense is dead because it's just not needed anymore. I think there's the the, the two points that were, were made just then were, um, I guess, you know, data integration and integrating with systems of your suppliers and your customers to provide that, um, that transparency of supply chain so that you can see what's coming and what's going and plan for it and, and relationship integration as well, which is what Michael was talking about, because so often we forget that people do business with um, with people, not with data or machines or anything like that. And and um, it, certainly in the in the procurement setting, that's becoming a um, a really increasing focus is to make sure that your supplier relationship management plans are really robust and they're actually tailored to provide uh, value to the business rather than just being a kind of performance beating stick that they've been used in the past is how can we work collaboratively together um, and, and innovate to, to move both of our companies forward and then everybody benefits out of it. Yep. Excellent. Great comment, thank you. Um, okay, so I just wanted to pick up on another question that's come through, and this is an interesting one. I might throw this to you, Kieran, in the first instance, if that's okay, and um, and the others can add. Um, so the question's around, how do we ensure um, that the new supply chains and advanced manufacturing infrastructure are anchored in circular principles? For example, things like zero carbon, ethical sourcing and meaningful community engagement and jobs, which I think is a great, a great question and very topical, obviously, at the moment. Do you have any thoughts on that one, Kieran? 
Yeah, absolutely. This is a conversation that I have <clears throat> quite a lot with a lot of different customers, not just in um, or clients, not just in manufacturing, but in you know particularly in logistics and other um, businesses as well. Um, and and it's when I say it's 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 pretty difficult in the current Australian environment because there's no real um, impetus to do it from a policy settings perspective. It has to be driven by individual companies and corporate social responsibility and the drive to do the right thing. Um, you know, again, I keep on referring back to price and cost and all that type of stuff because that does rule it. More and more these days, um, businesses are putting a price for carbon in their in their business cases, in their operational business cases, so that it's not just, um, you know, well, like, you know, getting installing a diesel fleet is much cheaper than installing an electrical an electrical fleet from a um, total cost of ownership perspective. Therefore, we'll go down that line. But then, if you overlay that with a, um, a a potential carbon price or a virtual carbon price um, that your business is putting on that, then it actually changes the, the business quite, case quite substantially. So I think that's got to be a really keen th key thing. And, and it really, at the moment, unfortunately, has to come down to, um, to, to user adoption. But you know, if, if companies use that in the right way, um, then they can use that as a selling point on sustainability to their shareholders and their customers, rather than just reaching back to the bottom line again. Yeah, great point. Um, Michael, Kamal, did you have anything to add? Michael? Yeah, uh, just yesterday the Australian government announced the Recycling Modernisation Fund and so that's $190 million uh, from the Australian government which will turn into a, a, around a billion dollar initiative for the circular economy. So um, listeners should go and Google uh, the Recycling Modernisation Fund and there'll be more details I'm sure coming out over the coming days. But just a couple of practical examples, I guess. Um, I mentioned that I'm out at Moree in far west New South Wales. Uh, we're here to have meetings tomorrow uh, with the development of a hydrogen plant um, with a local bus company that have 18 buses. And they're looking to convert those buses from diesel to hydrogen power. Uh, the beauty of being out here at Moree is that we're looking to connect that um, to the local solar farm, a 300 acre solar farm, and we'll be able to produce green hydrogen. Um, you, you'll hear the, um, a lot of talk around green hydrogen and we have a great export potential for using this technology right here in Australia. Um, but again, back to our great researchers, we've got some of the best researchers in the world right here in Australia. And it's uh, terrific to take some of these professors out to uh, the factory floors and visit the regional communities. Um, next week, I'm gonna be down at Bega and Eden on the far south coast of New South Wales. Now this is a region that's been devastated by those bushfires and just now you know so close to the Victorian border and, and that border is going to be locked down uh, it's going to make it very hard for their tourism industry which is pretty much tourism is their biggest employer and so now they're looking and saying well through this crisis we need to adopt a more resilient approach and what can we do around potentially uh, with manufacturing and potentially using waste as a resource um, think about uh, council garbage tips have so much uh, resource just sitting there in the ground. Um, this could be used uh, for uh, recycling into 3D printing uh, and much more. So um, one of the professors is coming down with me to talk about her micro factory technology and this is world's first technology that can uh, recycle and repurpose waste uh, into 3D filaments and I'm talking everything from plastics through to um, electronic waste. And so I know now that it takes 6,000 mobile telephones to make one tonne of e-waste and out of that e-waste can be all the rare earth materials, as well as the plastics and the glass extracted separately. And then you've got these high value 3D printable materials that we can use in the manufacturing line. So there's a lot of potential out there in this circular economy. You're certainly gonna hear a lot more about it. And uh, again, reach out to us at any time because we're out there doing it on the ground. Michael, can I uh, can I ask a question um, on, on that, and if I may, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I often lament about Australia is that we always seem to be a bit of a, um, you know, we've got strong R and D, um, and and a lot of these like you know um, small hydrogen um, production facilities seem to be almost a bit of a proof of concept to to demonstrate that it can be done and it can be commercialised and all that type of stuff, but very rarely do we see these genuinely at, at, at the moment, and hopefully this will change, 
um, generally delivered at scale. Do you see Australia's role as being kind of the R&D IP development and then selling that IP offshore? Or do you think there's a genuine capability to to leverage that to a to an industrial scale to make it make an impact? Uh, I, in so many ways, and you know, I often say that I'd much rather see Australians have an export potential to seven billion potential customers around the world in addition to the 25 million uh, we have here as a population. So export is always front of mind, absolutely. Uh, the hydrogen technology, this project out here at Moree, you know, this is a real practical way because the company has their own bus fleet that they want to convert. So it's no longer just uh, should we give it a go, they actually in a practical way want to get hydrogen to power their fleet. So this is a real world example of uh, getting things happening on the ground. Uh, that research that'll come out of this project can then be replicated to bus fleets all over the nation. And if we get it right, why don't we export that technology? Super, uh, Ryan, thank you. Ryan, just, Sorry, commenting, Kamal, go ahead. just commenting on the on the circular economy question that came up uh, as part of that. I think one, one dimension that uh, we should also think about is the consumers uh, and their attitude towards buying is changing. So you have got a lot of consumers or customers who are who have got avail information available on their mobile phone. They are a lot more conscious in terms of how the product is getting produced, where it is getting produced, how sustainable those sources are. Now, I think one one is one part is looking at the manufacturing to basically look at how we can actually make it more circular. The second dimension to that is how do we actually make that a value proposition that we can take to the newer, younger consumers who are a lot more conscious around uh, uh, conservation, a lot more conscious around waste management, et cetera. So I think looking at innovative ways of creating that circular economy, along with an innovative way of taking it to market, I think those two dimensions that they work together will could create a, a really strong value proposition for organizations in Australia. Superb, thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, so I think I'll just do probably one more audience question and then um, one final question after that. Um, what role, if any, should government play in the resurgence of Australian manufacturing? Uh, perhaps, Michael, I could throw that to you first. Oh, sure. Well, I just think that, you know, the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre is an initiative of the Australian government. We're a not-for-profit company uh, funded by the government uh, to share our research and co-fund projects that can demonstrate advanced manufacturing capabilities. And so we've got those examples. I think we've got around 80 projects that we've co-funded now, and you can see them on the website and see the examples of companies that are uh, making that transformation. Um, you know, the skills uplift is gonna be big too. Uh, pretty much these days, if you can operate a PlayStation, you could operate a robotics welding machine. And so we need to show people firsthand that manufacturing has a bright future here in this country. And, you know, only 12 weeks ago in March, uh, when this crisis first hit us, it was you know, some pretty good horror stories out there. Uh, and the ventilator project is just one that we were able to pull together a local supply chain to produce ventilators. Now it was said that it couldn't be done or there'd be struggles to make it happen. And yet, you know, we've got ResMed, one of our great Australian startups, it's now a global enterprise. Um, supported uh, the project with 3,000 ventilators uh, made here in Australia. And we were able to build a local supply chain to build a whole new ventilator, uh, 2,000 units that are going to the national medical stockpile. Um, so this is great advanced manufacturing and building local supply chains to make high value, you know, high skilled jobs that need to put these things together. Uh, but we've, we've proved that we can do it in a very short space of time. And now we have those capabilities that again, we can export those ventilators if I just use that as one example. Excellent, thank you. And um, Kieran, do you have anything to add around the government's role? Yeah, absolutely. And and this just goes back to my supply chain risk perspective, and not so much um, the 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 manufacturing um, execution perspective per se. But um, uh, I think I think um, PPE and and medical devices as has shown that it's a critical part of the supply chain or Australia's Australia's inbound supply chain. I think the Australian government <coughs> needs to do some analysis to understand what other critical parts uh, of, of the Australian supply chain 
exist um, from from a risk perspective. So you know, if if cars stop getting imported or manufactured in Australia, um, is is the economy going to stop? You know, you could argue to an extent, um, maybe, but it's, we'll probably get around it. Um, but you know, there's other things that if it if the supply to the Australian public does stop or Australian institutions does stop, then that's going to have a really big impact. So I think they need to take a risk-based approach to map the whole value chain into Australia and understand where that risk is being um, uh, is, is 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 coming from, and then. Um, a, a, apply policy settings that adjust that risk. So, you know, I'm not I'm not a massive fan of of just subsidising everything because ultimately somebody the consumer's got to pay for it, right? Either directly or through taxes. Um, but but I think there's some policy settings that they can say, well, this is a critical um, component of the Australian value chain, and we really need to make sure that we've got control of that in as much as we can. And even if that's you're working with offshore partners and allies that we have trade agreements with and stuff like that, then that's that's some policy settings there. Thank you very much. Okay, I probably just had one more question to each of you um, just to wrap things up because I'm just conscious we're, we're getting near the end of our allotted time. Um, so I suppose just bringing everything together that we've been talking about, um, we've seen how COVID-19 um, has impacted manufacturing in Australia. In many ways, there's been some positive um, things that have come out of it, some reasons for change and ex accelerated development. But in terms of um, in a post-COVID landscape, what do you all see as the uh, the main challenges and opportunities for Australian manufacturing going forward? Um, maybe Michael, could I could I kick off with you? Yeah, sure. I think it's growing on this base that we already have. If I think about the wine industry, you know, we've got some global brands, uh, some great wineries that uh, grow great produce here and um, send it all around the world. Um, so we already have great brands and local jobs producing world's best product uh, to markets like the United States and, and many more. Um, but just now we have a project going that we're co-funding with a company called Cella, C-E-L-L-R, based in Western Australia. And they've developed world's first technology that can tra trace and track those wine bottles. So it fits into the, the, the lid of the wine bottle and that can, um, using blockchain technology, can trace those wine bottles to um, keep that brand's reputation strong uh, rather than fake bottles perhaps coming onto the market. So a great example of high value adding technology, uh, creating new skills in here in Australia uh, with technology that can be exported globally. So growing on the base that we already have this great brand of Australia and boosting the technology side of it uh, to increase our manufacturing base. That's the future for Australia. Very good, thank you. And Kieran, um, from yourself, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I think the challenges, and oh, I guess this is this has been a perennial challenge for Australian manufacturing is scale and cost, right? Um, what what we do well, what we do we do well, um, but what we bring in from overseas is because we can't do it competitively. You know, automotive manufacturing is a great example of that, is that it's, it's disappeared because people don't want to pay um, Australian manufacturing prices. That That's the reality of it, right? So um, I, I think that's always going to be a challenge. And so um, labour is a big component of that, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't look for other parts of the supply chain and the value stream to reduce your overheads and reduce your overall cost to serve the customer. And that's about, you know, better data integration, being able to make smarter decisions. Um, you know, demand driven MRP, I think is going to be a huge one in the future to make sure that we're manufacturing um, to, to the actual demand instead of pushing stuff forward. Um, you know, delayed differentiation. There's a host of ways that we can collectively reduce the cost base and make even those, you know, kind of, um, those manufacturing sectors that have just been um, competing with low-cost country sources make it a better and more viable option, but we do have to be really, really smart about it. Thank you. And um, Kamal, finally from you. Yeah, and uh, it's 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 fascinating as to to see that this the difference between a risk person and an innovation and a technology person. So I I see only opportunities coming out of this, uh, Brian, and in, in fact. If I break that down into people part of it, I think we will, given the 
given the challenge that we have had, now we have got the ability to actually export our, our skills from a people point of view to the world and also bring the skills in the world to us because of all the all the uh, working from home experiences that we have had. So I think there is a massive opportunity for us to actually cross pollinate on the skill side. On the process side, I see that this is going to be the reset for us where we can, a lot of organizations will go back and say, what can I do differently to, to become more efficient, more effective? So there is this COVID is giving us an opportunity to reset those processes. And then the last bit is around the technology part of it. Digital is becoming becoming more mainstream. It's no longer a concept. We are all living through it, through this webinar. And I think technology reset is going to help organizations reduce their costs and become more effective as, as they go into the post-COVID normal. Superb. Thank you, Kamal. That's a great way to finish. And um, look, that, that brings us to the end of today's session. And I really want to thank you all, Michael, Kamal, and Kieran, for your valued insights today. Um, I'm sure everyone listening will agree um, it was a great session to kick off our webinar series and we're looking forward to uh, to the next one. So we've just put up on screen there now details of our next webinar. Um, there's one in two weeks time on the 22nd of July uh, where we'll be discussing innovation as a result of COVID-19, looking at how the current pandemic has altered the manufacturing industry and how manufacturers have adopted more advanced methods. And then the second one after that, or the third one in the series on the 5th of August, discussing how to succeed locally and globally, looking at how Australian manufacturers can succeed in the quest to reshore manufacturing, what balance needs to be struck. Uh, Michael, you're gonna be um, kindly joining me for the whole series, I believe. Um, so we look forward to, to having you involved and we'll have some other experts um, for each of the other sessions as well. Um, all these webinar details will be shared with you in the follow-up email from today's session. Um, and finally, before we close, I just want to mention there is a short feedback survey that's going to launch once you close the webinar. And we'd really appreciate it if you could fill out that uh, webinar um, questionnaire and give us some feedback from today's session so we can take that into account for the next session. So thank you for joining us today, everybody, and we hope that you could join us for the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>